before I um, start, I'd just like to um, lead in a word of prayer. Father, um, you know what goes on in all our lives. Um, you know what's been going on in my life this week. And uh, Lord, I just pray that I, I thank you that you forgive me for the stuff that I've done and said that it's been wrong. And I can come today as a clean vessel to share your word today. So thank you for that, Father. I appreciate that. Amen. Right. <clears throat> A couple of months ago, um, <coughs> Tracy and I had uh, Mal and Cheryl Potts come and stay. If you remember, Mal um, used to be the pastor of the Anglican Church in Cottesloe that we used to attend, and now he's, uh, remember he did a presentation on youth care. He actually gets paid by the government to um, be a chaplain to the um, government school's principals. I remember he did a presentation. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Mel was probably worn out in the church that, uh, down at, uh, uh, in Cottesloe, you know, and uh, um, when you t turn up to a church, you actually don't know what's going on inside a church. You know, you, s you sit there and you think, Jesus, this is a magnificent church. They preach the word of God. They evangelise. I love it. But stuff goes on, and, and he just got worn out. So this was a change in direction it's been a really blessing for him but we decided we'd invite him up for a for a farm stay and so they could just have a break and refresh and so over that weekend over that period of time we it was during harvest um they sat on the headers and talked to the boys they um uh, that's the york boys and they're fairly hard to talk to but uh they are, mel was able to draw them both out and uh, they went into the bin with uh, uh, the other boys in the trucks and um, we run them out to the rocks, um, which they're absolutely gobsmacked with our rocks, like any visitors that come to Mucka are. Uh, it just happened to be the weekend that um, Tom Curtin was in Mucka, and so great family um, entertainment, so they love that. And then, of course, they came to church and met all you guys, and um, at the end of the time, they were just blown away by Mucka. The culture we've got here the people we've got here, the influence that the Christians have got here, and they just they were just blown away by mucker. But of course, when you get someone like that come into your, um, into your home and, and living with you, you spend a fair bit of time sitting around talking, having cups of tea and that sort of stuff. So we're um, sitting around and having spiritual conversations, and, um, and we got talking about just different things about the church at Cottesloe and stuff that was going on there and... Uh, and I guess we've got talking about uh, the church at Maka, you know, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. And um, <clears throat> I had a light bulb moment. Mel said to me, he said, you know, Jeff, everyone pushes a barrow. Everyone pushes a barrow. So I got thinking about that, and uh, and Mel is exactly right. We all push a barrow. For example, we've got Christians in Mucka who don't come to church because we think we're too Pentecostal. And we've had Christians here that think that the church is not Pentecostal enough. enough. And both parties push their barrow. Then Mel said something to me, he said, it's absolutely fine for Christians to push a barrow, but the key question is, we all have to ask ourselves, where is Jesus? Is Jesus in the barrow? Is he helping push the barrow? Or is Jesus way out here somewhere? Nowhere near the barrow. So that's the key question. If your barrow is causing you to not meet with other Christians... Jesus is way out here. If your barrow is causing disruption in the fellowship, Jesus is out here as well. And if your barrow is causing destruction between relationships, then Jesus is neither not in the barrow nor he's helping push it. So if your barrow conflicts with the essential teachings of God's word, Jesus wouldn't be helping you either. Recently, um, this week, I've actually reread Graham Carslake's 
a little book called The DNA of Churches of Christ. Now, the Churches of Christ, or the Disciples of Christ, had its beginning in the US during the 1800s. As white settlers spread, out, spread west across America, churches were being established on the frontier, each church having foundation members from all sorts of denominations. Mostly from Europe, the settlers brought their faith of Christ with them. And as they pushed west, as, as little towns uh, and places of worship were established, there were Anglicans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, Calvinists, Baptists, whatever there is, you name it, they were there. But being small churches, they wisely, instead of pushing their own denomination, their own denominational barrow, sorry, they adopted strong principles that they all agreed upon and they simply called themselves a Church of Christ. And summarising, these are the agreed principles. Acknowledge Jesus as the only head of the church. Exclude all sectarian names and use the title Christian only. So instead of being a Baptist, you're a Christian or whatever. Use the New Testament as the only rule of faith and practice. No man-made creeds. Adopt the biblical concept of faith, that by faith you are saved and salvation is available to anyone who chooses to believe. Make Christian character the only real test of membership and fellowship. Observe the Lord's Supper weekly. Practice believers' baptism. Establish, establish congregational government plurality of elders and the rights of lay leaders to lead, promote the right, sorry, the right to private judgment, liberty of conscience and mutual responsibility, work toward the union of all followers of Christ so that the world would believe. Quite an extensive list. So when the Australian, when it came to Australia, the Australian churches of Christ <clears throat> They, uh, uh, which was the same sort of thing, a group of autonomous churches that came together, uh, the list was, re re was slightly redefined. And here's this is a bit, of a bit of an easier list. Christ is the head of the church. And these are supposed to be on the overheads, but I've got here late. The Bible, or the Word of God, is our only authority. The salvation plan of faith, repentance... Baptism for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit is our core good news message. Observe the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Mutual ministry by all members of the congregation. And a call for unity as members from all churches to affirm one another as Christians. Now if you want to push a barrow, here's a list that I'm sure... Jesus would help push. More recently, the Churches of Christ use a motto which was first published, as far as I can determine, and thanks to my sister Val, by Rupus Medinius in 1625, and that is, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity or love. And as churches, we also use a slogan where the scripture speaks... We speak, where the scripture is silent, we're silent. Do you know Martin Isles from the Christian Lobby? You know, heard of him? Right. <coughs> I was listening to him this week as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and Martin Isles, he also uses that slogan. Where the, where the scripture speaks, we speak. Where the scripture is silent, he is silent. Anyway. In the course of conversation, Mel then asked me, well, Jeff, what barrow do you push? It really made me think. Most of my barrows are probably from the list above. But because the elders have given me the privilege to stand up here in front of you, I'm going to give you my big three 
this morning. Number one, read God's word every day. Make it a habit. Grasp the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is not only reliable, but it's also sufficient. It gives you the wisdom you need even in 2022 when the smart people are saying we're the most advanced generation to ever have lived. They say we don't need God's word. We are the enlightened generation. But I'm saying the Bible is not only reliable for today, but it's also sufficient for today. We don't need any special revelation we don't need any special word from a special person or someone who thinks they're a special person uh, to give a special word. It's all here, right in front of us in the scriptures. Don't wait for an audible voice from God. It's all there in the Bible. I like Ian Shadbolt's view. If you want God to speak to you audibly, listen to the Bible on tape. Now let me remind you of a story about the temptation of Jesus. Jesus is the word, Logos. Jesus is the word. But he didn't come up with any new words to defeat Satan. He quoted scripture that had already been given to us. If the word of God was sufficient for Jesus, surely the word of God is sufficient for us in our everyday situations. Also, it's amazing how passages of Scripture come alive and quite often appropriate for your circumstances right at the right point of time. Now, I've highlighted passages of Scriptures one day and come back to the same passage later and wondered, why did I highlight that? It was a word for me just at the right time. Martin Isles quotes Psalm 119, 105. You know this one? The Word of God... It's a lamp to our path. So when we want direction, it gives light to the pathway ahead. It does it in two ways. One way is, when you read God's word, you learn principles, the general outline of how to live your life. You receive guidance for your daily living. But if you're reading the Bible regularly, Martin Ole says, Another thing happens very, very often. And that is you get a, a specific word of scripture for a specific thing. For example, quite often when we're faced with things and circumstances we're not sure about or what to do, a verse of scripture jumps out. It's just the thing we need to know. Martin Isles says, it happens to me all the time, especially when I'm speaking in front of people. If you're reading the Bible as a habit, then you'll get those answers. In James chapter 1, it says, The word of God is like a mirror. Now, when I look in a mirror, and I do sometimes, and I see my hair sticking up. No one comment on that, please. Or I see a piece of lunch stuck in my teeth, or worse still, lunch down my shirt. I fix it. The mirror shows me that something's wrong. It shows you the problem and it causes you to act. The Bible does exactly the same. It's a mirror. It shows you what you need to change in your life. It brings you to an action. Now if you were to read Ephesians 6, and that's the chapter of the armour of God, there's a list of defensive items in that armour. You have a shield, you have a helmet, a breastplate, there is something else, one offensive item, one attacking weapon, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. There's power in the word of God. I think a lot of Christians have lost confidence in the Bible. We don't read it enough. We don't quote it enough when we're out and about. The Bible is our best offensive weapon. And remember too, when the scripture speaks, we speak. When the scripture is silent, we're silent. In Romans chapter 14, we can read, For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, 
But another believer with a sensitive com conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who do. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Those who eat all kinds of food do it to honour the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods and want us to please the Lord, give them thanks. The principle here is, when the scripture is silent, we're silent. And when the scripture speaks, we speak. So we're also saying, don't push those barrows. Believe it if you like, but don't push it. Paul is saying, they're not essential doctrines. So number one for me is, read God's word regularly. The Bible is not only reliant, but it's sufficient. <clears throat> And number two, church attendance is a big one for me. And that encompasses many things. It means congregational worship. It means obviously observing the Lord's Supper as we've done today. It, it means receiving teaching from God's word. And a really important one that sometimes we overlook. It means we're fellowshipping with other believers. It's who you run with that determines your character. Work it out. Stones sharpens stone. Of course we have to live in the world. <clears throat> Jesus did too. But if you're running only with the world, guess who's influencing you? I'm strong on go to church with a sense of giving rather than receiving. Don't just go to church to get blessings. Have an attitude. It's not all about me. And Hebrews 10 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now the day of his return is drawing near. If you are not here, how can you encourage, strengthen, comfort or enhearten fellow believers? And conversely, how can they do it to you? On a cruise <coughs> that Tracy and I took to New Zealand, Tracy and I met a woman that we sort of knew, let's say. She went to PLC with my sisters. And she was having uh, marital problems, so rather than hang with her husband, she used to hang with us a bit. But we were able to ask her to join us in the church service on board the ship. She really enjoyed it. She took communion with us. And later she shared that prior to her marriage, she was a regular church attender but had fallen away. Trace was a bit able to get alongside her and minister her and have spiritual conversations with her. And it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't have gone to church. You know, it's an interesting one. I don't understand why some Christians... Um, don't go to church when they're on holidays. I find worshipping in uh, different church meetings, you meet with other Christian brothers and sisters is in different states or different countries, is a real highlight when I'm travelling. We've got a church in Melbourne, and the days before COVID, we used to go to Melbourne to watch the footy. Uh, there's a church there, an inner city church that we used to attend whenever we were in, in Melbourne. It was different. It was Asian. But you know what? I loved it. And on the same cruise that I was just talking about, when we were in one of the ports on the east coast of New Zealand, uh, the ship parks at the thing and then uh, at the wharf and you have a full day to do the touristy things in that town. But it happened to be on a Sunday. So most pa the passengers disembarked and did the touristy things on offer there. But we caught a taxi and attended a church service. And during the fellowship time after the service, we met a lovely couple who invited us to their oceanfront home for lunch. And after lunch, they gave us a personal tour of the best parts of their town. At the end of the day, they dropped us back on the wharf to rejoin the ship. So there's added benefits going to church when you're on holidays. But finally, in this little section, as parents... 
what sort of message are you sending your children if church attendance is not important to you? Right, the third barrow that I'll push is every believer has a responsibility to evangelise. I was talking to a pastor of a fairly big church in Perth and I said, how many baptisms would have you blokes do you have in a year? And I was shocked with his answer. He said, I don't think we've had any for a couple of years. I couldn't believe it. I reckon they'd drop the ball. What are they focusing on if they're not focusing on evangelism? What barrows are they pushing? Am I that biased? believing that evangelism is one of the church's key responsibilities. I mean, Matthew 28, the last couple of verses, is pretty plain to me. That Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you, to the very end of the age. How are unbelievers going to hear the good news if we, who are God's ambassadors, don't share it? Recently, over the Christmas period, we've, uh, I know we've read uh, a couple of times, we've read the, uh, the Christmas story from Luke 2. You know about the angels and the shepherds out in the fields? There's a fair bit, of go- fair bit going on in that story but I can't help focus on verse 17. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said. You see something amazing happen, you hear something amazing happen, you experience something amazing happen, you tell others. Then there's another story in the scriptures about how um, Jesus uh, healing the demon-possessed man uh, and it's found in Mark chapter 5 if you want to look at it. Remember, uh, the evil spirits uh, left the man and, uh, at Jesus' command and uh, entered the pigs and the pigs ran over the cliff. You remember that? Well, these are the verses that I focus on. Jesus said, Go home to your family and tell them everything that the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. Then it says, So the man went off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed at what he had told them. Now, that was chapter 5 of Mark. If you flick over to chapter 8 of Mark, we find Jesus ministering back at the Sea of Galilee and and the region of the ten towns. And this is the account of Jesus feeding the 4,000. In verse 1 it says, A large crowd had gathered. Could this crowd be as a result of the um, healed man sharing his encounter with Jesus? Is it possible that this man was one of the first missionaries effectively communicating what Jesus had done in his life? And that's what's expected of us. Communicate what Jesus has done for us. That's all. Once we've completed our part, our part of the deal, it's up to the Holy Spirit and it's his role to convict and convert. I'm very sure that Jesus is not only in this barrow, but he's helping push it. You've heard it said, quite possibly... You're the only Bible that some people read. You've heard that? That means we have to live a Christian life. If unbelievers are reading you, what sort of picture are they getting? It's so important for us as Christians to strive Christ-likeness. I like to ask myself in circumstances, WWJD, what would Jesus do in this circumstances? Well, of course I have lapses. Are we living out the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Unfortunately, I'm not. 
But joy is a big one that I want to focus on here. It's quite often overlooked. Christians who are negative, focusing on their troubles instead of the blessings we've received from Jesus, rarely expressing joy. When people see you and talk to you, do they see Jesus? I'm going to embarrass Maureen here. She's a great example. You only got to look at Maureen and you can tell that she's a Christian just by her countenance. She never looks sad. Sorry, Maureen. <laughs> but you, you know, like, I want to be like you. And I've got a fair bit of work to do. So it's so important for us to display the characteristics of Christ. We have to display a difference so that people want to have what we have. In 2 Corinthians, Paul, 2 Corinthians 2, Paul describes us as a sweet perfume. He says, God uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. An aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many who do not, who we do not peddle the word of God to profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity to those as those sent from God. The C.S. Lewis once wrote, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked with a mere mortal. Let's just take that in again. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked with a mere mortal. So put another way, <clears throat> every human contact we have has eternal consequences. Every day we have opportunities to make an eternal difference in the lives of people around us through a quiet witness of a Christ-like life or an encouraging word. Never underestimate your influence on Jesus' behalf in other people's lives. Well, there you go. <clears throat> I've pushed my barrows. Number one, read the Bible. It's not only reliable, but it's sufficient. Number two, meet with other Christians regularly. In other words, go to church. And the last one, live a life that reflects Jesus. Strive to be Christ-like because you are an evangelist. I'm very confident that Jesus is not in, only in those three barrows, but he's also helping me push them. What about your barrow? Consider where Jesus is. Is he, in, is he in the barrow? Is he helping push it? Or is he way out there? Let's be in prayer. Father God, those three things that I've pointed out, the importance of us knowing and living the word of God, reading it daily and uh, learning principles for life. And the second one, meeting with other Christians and, and fellowshipping together. Um, and the third one is, Lord, there's no plan B. You have left your followers on earth um, to tell unbelievers about a new life, a new life in Christ, an eternal life. There's no plan B. So, Lord, help us to live up to that expectation that you have. In Jesus' name, amen.